remember, like Bob Clark and Doug Campbell, they actually devoted a show. What was it called? The Lies of Fletcher Pratt? Yeah, the Lies of Fletcher Pratt. What right. a joke. Yeah. What an embarrassment. I mean, those... Oh, yeah. Rip it, Roger. Man, I love, love, love the intro. What's up, people? It's your boy, the Triple B, Big Bad Bob, here with you. This is the Lone Gummin Podcast, and this is episode number 259-er. This week, it's all about Dago, baby. But before we get there, a word from Big Bad Bob about our succulent, sweet, spicy sauce. That's right. It's the Silk City, baby. Tell us about it, Bobby. Big Bad Bob here with you for Silk City Hot Sauces. Why Silk City? Because this hot sauce comes to you directly from Patterson, New Jersey, also known as Silk City. These hot sauces are 100% natural, gluten-free, vegan, contain no chemicals, fillers, dyes, or junk. Everything is packed into recyclable glass containers because glass doesn't leach weird flavors into the product. All other hot sauces are sourced in small batches from locally bought fresh peppers. It's all about the pepper people I'm telling you. Your boy, Big Bad Bob, loves his food like he loves his women. Hot and spicy, but not so hot you can't eat them. <laughs> so, if you love yourself some sauce and you're tired of trying to transform your bland meat into something edible, with the tip of a jar, you will transform your life forever. Head over to Silk cityhotsauce.com place an order and upon checkout enter the code GUNMAN that's G-U-N-M-A-N for 20% off of your entire order you won't regret it thank me later peace well thank you Bob and if you haven't yet get your butts over to silkcityhotsauce.com and put an order in. Help support the show and get yourself some damn fine hot sauce in the process. All right, let's get down to business. It's Lancer weekend, folks. That means there's probably a hell of a lot of people in Dallas right now listening to this show. And if you are, I say, what is up, people? Hopefully you've seen the presentation and you dug it. Or you're going to see it today and you're going to dig it. That's right. Um, I know some people that are going to be down there, Mr. Joe Borelli, uh, my co-host for the Martin presentation at Lancer, is going to be there. Doug Campbell is going to be there, host of the Dallas Action, and my co-host for Quick Hits, a JFK News and Notes uh, podcast that I, that we do together. And uh, Chuck Ocelli is going to be there, I do believe. Uh, Carmine Savastano is going to be there, I do believe. Uh, my buddy Alex Harris is going to be there, I do believe. My friend Mr. Kenneth Zedeker uh, is going to be there. I know that. Uh, Robert Grodin will be there. All kinds of people. You're going to have fun. Like I said, the, the, the conference is sold out. You it, you might find you might find some scallywag on the corner trying to uh, scalp tickets. Uh, get one if you can. 
That's that's all I'll tell you. If even if you can't get into Lancer, you still have fun in Dallas, uh, perusing the sights and 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 the scenes uh, that the beautiful city of Dallas uh, presents for you. I still remember fondly uh, four years ago zipping around Dallas on a scooter as my main mode of transportation. <laughs> we stayed in a Airbnb downtown, and uh, I must have rode that damn scooter to Dealey Plaza and uh, the hotel that uh, Lancer was at, my God, probably 10 times to and fro. <laughs> a good time had by all. Big Bad Bob on a scooter. Yeah. Yes, I know. But enough about me. Let's talk about somebody who is intrigued me for a while um he's a very endearing fellow <laughs> by the name of daryl dago garner now for those of you not familiar uh you have not been listening to the show and i will scold you later but uh pause it right now if you haven't and go back and listen to quick hits number 14 okay and listen to the Mark Lane interview of Daryl Gardner. There you go. It is the craziest interview that I've ever seen in my life, ever read in my life. And also go back to Quick Hits 49, the most recent one that just came out. And I had a little bit in there about Dago. Uh, somebody found a manuscript in a desk in New Orleans at an antique shop. Um, and it was basically, well, it was called how to be a bounty hunter by Daryl Dago Gardner is told to somebody. And it basically uh, outlined uh, his involvement in the Kennedy assassination, which is interesting, but, uh, most folks, right. No, uh, Daryl Dago Gardner, uh, for having been accused of shooting Warren Reynolds in the head. Uh, Warren Reynolds worked at the Johnny Reynolds, uh, car dealership, I guess you want to call it, uh, around the corner from where Tippett was shot. And, I believe it was sometime in January after the assassination. Uh, he was turning out the lights in the dealership, which I guess was in the basement. And he went down there and he went to turn off the lights and he, he noticed that the, uh, the bulb was broken down there and there was no light. And somebody came out of the shadows and shot him in the head with a 22 and knocked his glasses off his face. And whoever that was scurried away. And uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds was able to get back up the steps and uh, basically uh, call for help um, and kind of collapsed on a car hood. Uh, but he, he was uh, a little shook up, but uh, no, no permanent damage. Apparently the bullet uh, glanced off of his skull instead of entering it, which is a good thing for him. Um, but the main suspect in this shooting was a man by the name of Daryl Dago Garner. And, you know, Dago was a, a bad seed, if you will, a uh, criminal element, um, mid twenties at about the time, 24, 25, uh, ran with some rough, rough dudes, um, you know, did a bunch of drinking and whoring and, uh, you know, just general, uh, you know, 1960s bad guy stuff, right? Known to the police as a, you know, a bad seed. Well, apparently he ran his mouth to some of the wrong people. And the cops picked him up and arrested him for shooting Warren Reynolds. Well, they had to let him go because he passed a lie detector test. Um, he had 
eyewitnesses as to where he was that night. Uh, and his girlfriend uh, attested that, you know, she also was with him uh, later that evening. And she passed a lie detector test as well, despite hanging herself in jail a couple weeks later over another guy. <laughs> and, you know, this woman, uh, I think her name was Nancy McDonald or Nancy Mooney McDonald, something like that. And apparently she had been a uh, stripper at the Carousel Club before that. So we have these intersecting and interweaving lines of, you know, a lot of these characters interacting with each other, knowing each other, um, and so forth. So, you know, there's not a lot on Dago out there. I do know that Dago died in, I believe it was 71 or 72, from a drug overdose. Um, and like I said, we have the Mark Lane interview. We have uh, this mysterious manuscript that was found in a desk in New Orleans because Dago had ties back to New Orleans, folks, not just Dallas, as did the R.V. Oswald. In fact, uh, Garner, okay, uh, was the name... Mrs. Jesse James Garner uh, and Jesse James Garner were the couple that rented uh, part of their house to the Oswalds on Magazine Street uh, in New Orleans at the time when he was handing out these flyers. And this was right before where they were living right before Marina left with Ruth to go back to Dallas and Lee allegedly went to Mexico. But uh, my friend Fred uh, Lit Litwin was kind enough to send me two more interviews with Dago that I didn't even know existed. And that's what we are going to be perusing today and see if we can glean some more information out of what he told Alcock and Garrison and there's also another interview with a fellow by the name of Ken Elliott, who I believe was a local New Orleans uh, disc jockey. But we'll get there, I promise. So first off, let's uh, let's go with what he told Ken Elliott, and then we'll get into what he told uh, the Garrison team. Who was Ken Elliott, right? So Ken Elliott. Uh, was the former president and co-owner of Barks Beverages, spelled like Barks Root Beer, B-A-R-Q. He was the former owner of the Ormond Plantation, Ho Boys of New Orleans, Cascade Wholesalers, Diamond Ace Hardware, the Entree Vu Recording Studio, which is probably where this interview took place. Holt Plumbing, the charter member of the crew of Icarus and the founder of the Southern Yet Club of Louisiana. <laughs> and uh, his daddy's name was Jake the Cat Elliot. So, another DJ. Um, and I'm sure a colorful character. Reading here from his obituary and the memories shared by others. Uh, probably quite a colorful uh, dude in his own right. But uh, so this first interview with Ken Elliott, your name, sir. Answer. Diego Garner. Now, <laughs> those of you who do listen to the show, and uh, I thought I had Dago's voice back in episode 14 of the uh, <laughs> Quick Hits. Uh, I thought Dago talked a little something like this, like this here, but uh, apparently no. Um, according to <laughs> according to uh, the mysterious manuscript that was written down, and uh, they actually gave a description of Dago, who was about six foot tall, brown curly hair, 
talked real low, uh, arm tattoos, wore tight jeans, and biker gear. Uh, sport shirt, sunburnt, ruddy complexion. Uh, overall, just a real handsome type dude. So my day goes going to sound a little different now, uh, knowing what the real one sounded like, just to d distinguish uh, questions and answers here in these interviews. Your name, sir? Diego Garner. Diego Garner. And what is your legal given name? Daryl. But my first name's Dago. Everybody calls me Dago. All right, Dago. Uh, now you're in the city of New Orleans on this Tuesday, June 26th. That is the 27th. Oh, sorry, 27th. And you have come voluntarily to the studio here to, to record the facts that you are about to present. And we are going to make one copy for you to hold. And you are going to leave one copy in our custody with the understanding that it is not to be released to newspapers or television or magazine sources without your okay or in the event of your death. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, now, how long have you been back in New Orleans, Dago? Approximately three weeks at this time. I have been in Delcom, Louisiana, and I just come back on the bus to New Orleans four days ago. Four days ago. Now, I understand that you have knowledge of facts pertaining to the assassination conspiracy and the death of President Kennedy. You have firsthand knowledge of such facts. Is that correct? That is correct. And I understand that you were at the district attorney's office yesterday and are due to go back tomorrow for a polygraph examination. I was there yesterday and had the interview so they could figure out what kind of questions they wanted to ask me uh, for the polygraph test. Now, you were at the DA's office voluntarily? Yes. I talked to Alcock and Garrison, District Attorney Alcock, and he had two more guys in there in the office at the same time, and they was all asking me questions. Now, why did you go to the DA's office? Was it at their request, their suggestion? This here is the advice of my attorney, Jim McPherson. He's in the National Bank of Commerce building at 122.8 uh, Commerce building. In other words, you consulted McPherson and told him what you knew, and he advised you to make these facts known to the DA's office? Yes. At first, Hugh Amesworth from the News Weekly advised me to go to Dallas and give it uh, to Lieutenant Cunningham of the Intelligence Police down there to call. Uh, why did he advise that, did he say? He said the best thing for me was to get out of New Orleans because Garrison would hang me by the balls. But he also said that the paper was representing Clay Shaw. Did he offer to pay your expenses to Dallas or anything of that nature? No, but he said he would guarantee me attorneys to represent me there. How long was this now? How long ago was this now? This was the day before yesterday. Had you already talked to your attorney here prior to the offer from Ainsworth? Nope, sure didn't. That was when you went to seek advice? Well, when I went to talk to my attorney, Ainsworth had given me his house, house phone number. He also gave me a number in New York where he's at, and he gave me the number in Houston where I could reach him at. Do you have those numbers on your person at this time? Yep, sure do. Just for validity of this tape, why not give those numbers? Dago is getting the numbers out of his wallet. This number is News Weekly in New York. It's HA1-1234. That's Hugh Amesworth in New York. And also he has another guy working for him in Houston, Texas. And that's CA8-8787. And his home phone number is JA5-9815. All right, fine. That's on record now. And a Lieutenant Cunningham of the Intelligence Police Department, which he told me to call, was Riverside 3-9711 in Dallas, Texas, just for the record, you know. 
how did Ainsworth get in touch with you? I called Ainsworth from Attorney Caldwin from Dallas, uh, Texas, Emmett Caldwin. He's a criminal lawyer in Dallas, and he gave me Ainsworth's number and told me to call him. In other words, you had consulted an attorney in Dallas before you consulted Mr. McPherson here in New Orleans. That's right. Elliot, and he advised that you contact Ainsworth with the News Weekly? That's right. However, your attorney here, after you consulted him, following your conversation with Mr. Ainsworth, he advised you to go to D.A. Garrison's office and offer your testimony? Well, at first he said that sounded right. But after he said, well, said the News Weekly is sponsoring play for attorneys and they're going to send you to Dallas and you wouldn't live a week there after you got there. Let me ask you this, Dago. Why did you finally decide, after the elapsed time involved here, why did you finally decide to consult an attorney and tell him what you knew? Well, it got where every time I tried to go work someplace. Uh, getting a little bit closer here to the mic, will you, Dago? Sorry. Sorry. I can't go to work anywhere and hold a job down. I got to keep a ducking and a dodging all the goddamn time. And I was in Dallas a short while ago when my ex-wife said a sheriff was there looking for me and everything over this here. So I figured I might as well go ahead and get it over with. In other words, your ex-wife said a sheriff from the Dallas police was looking for you in connection with the Kennedy assassination? Yes. And they had been at my mama's house and my mama and them said they asked me to stay out of town. All right, will you, will you tell us uh, now what is your connection with the case and what do you know? What information do you have to give to the authorities? Well, I was going with Nancy Mooney, this here in Stripper, to work for Jack Ruby. What time period was this? This here was just prior to when Kennedy got whacked. Mid-63? I would say a month or so before he got killed, and I had stolen a lot of things, and uh, Warren Reynolds then owned a car lot up there, and he had talked to me about Clay Shaw. Uh, he said if I wanted to make some money, big money, I should go work for Clay Shaw. Did they give you any idea what type of work it was? No, they didn't say what it was, but... Well, then what happened? Well. Nancy took me down to the carousel club downtown. Jack Ruby owned it to get me fixed up with him. Did you meet Ruby? No, Ruby wasn't there at this time. The two guys were there, and one of them was gray-headed, and I think it was Shaw, and another guy there was some Italian. Their name was not given to you at the time? No. It wasn't, but I told the DA yesterday, and this here will be in a polygraph test that I'm taking. What did they talk to you about, these two men? Well, they just said Jack Ruby wasn't there, and we couldn't get down to no business until he was. They still at that time did not make any reference to Kennedy? Warren Reynolds. <laughs> After, this here's the guy that I went to. Dale down there for shooting said that Kennedy had to be killed. And see, Roberts worked there at the car lot, too, and they shot him with a shotgun. Now, you say Reynolds, you went to jail for shooting? Did you shoot him? No, 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 I didn't. I took me a lie detector test and all that, and I didn't shoot him. And I was with Nancy Mooney the night he got shot. She was your witness, your alibi. Yes, and she's hung herself now in jail. And what was she in jail for? At this time, she was in there for fighting. I think it was what they said, but she never hung herself. I don't believe that. I don't either, Dago. All right, did you ever meet Jack Ruby? <laughs> yes, I have. How long after your first trip to the carousel did you meet Ruby? Uh, I would say uh, in a week or less than a week. Where did this meeting take place? 
on Industrial Boulevard. Industrial Boulevard? That's in Dallas. Not at either of Ruby's places of business? This here was his place down there. What was the name of that place? I, I don't know for sure what it was. But it was in one of his nightclubs. And who was present there when you met Ruby beside you and Ruby? Just me and Ruby. But uh, I was told to come back to the carousel. And uh, this is where I think I was supposed to meet Clay Shaw and this other guy. All right. Now, when you met Ruby, what did he tell you? Well, he just said they had some deal they had to work out. And I was given a gun. And I went out to a guy's house. And they gave me a pistol. I went down and hocked the same day. You remember the name of the man from whom you got the pistol? Nope. Don't recall. And they did not tell you what the pistol was for? They just gave me the gun, but I went and hocked it because I wouldn't carry it because I had been caught carrying a gun in the state of Texas before. And they charge you $132.20 for carrying a gun in Texas. What reason did you have for picking up the gun? Or didn't you know that you were going to pick up a gun? Yes, I knew that I was going to. Yep, I knew I was going to pick pick that. But uh, you see, Jack Ruby was a queer. And this here guy that I went to his house was geared up for something or another too. <laughs> and that was a friend of his. So I went out to his house. In other words, you say that Jack Ruby was a homosexual. Yeah. To your certain knowledge. Well, I've been asked on a polygraph test up there if I ever had any dealings with him like that, but no, no, I never did. Hmm. Okay. So after you picked up that pistol, you hocked it. What were you supposed to do after you picked up that pistol? I never did get any instructions on that. I left and went to Las Vegas, Nevada, baby. In other words, you took the pistol, hocked it, and left town. Yes, sir, that's right. Were you supposed to go back to Ruby's or what? Yes, I was supposed to go back to the Carousel Club, but different arrangements, whatever they were going to do, but I never did go back. I see, and where were you when the actual assassination took place? I was in Las Vegas. How long before the assassination was this meeting with Ruby? Uh, from a month or two months. Uh, it couldn't have been two months. I don't know. I, I mean, you're talking about the assassination, right? Yes. Eh, about a month or so. About a month or so. Okay, what was your reaction when you heard that Kennedy had been killed? Eh, nothing really. Uh, I mean, uh, a guy at the Chesterfield Club in Vegas was setting up uh, free drinks and everything, and I was just there drinking. Setting up free drinks? Yes. Did your conversation with Ruby or your meeting with these men, with these other two men, come back to your mind then? Did you connect the two in your mind? Yeah. I uh, I kind of got a little scared about it, but I know that I may have been involved in it in some way. Uh, you know, that, that uh, coming up, but uh, look at it this way. They ain't got... They ain't going to name me because if they get down there, then it would just be somebody testifying against them, see? Let me ask you this, Dago. You've seen pictures of Clay Shaw? Yep. Could you, from the pictures you've seen, make a positive ID honestly and feel you know that without a shadow of doubt that this is the man you met in the carousel club? Well, now... <laughs> The district attorney asked me the same question, and I told them what the guy looked like and told them how tall he was and everything, and they seemed to think it was just about the same as Clay Shaw, but right now, if Clay Shaw was to walk up here, I couldn't say for sure that was Clay Shaw. And there was no name whatsoever given to any of these two other two men. They were not introduced by name or whatever. No. There wasn't, but the girl, Mooney Nancy, mentioned Clay Shaw and things, and then also at the car lot down there, uh, he said if I wanted to make some big money, I could go to work for Clay Shaw. And this other guy said you shouldn't be telling him things like that because he's going to get us in trouble. 
To your knowledge, you never came into contact with Lee Harvey Oswald? No, I never talked to Lee Harvey. Where were you earlier in 63 and late 62, Dago? Oh, wow. Hmm. All over. California, Nevada, Texas. I mean, I just kind of loafed around, you know? Uh, When's the first time you came to New Orleans? This year. This year, this is your first trip here. Is there anything else that you can think of or any other names that you would like to document here or add to this tape? And one other question here while we're on the subject, this meeting at the carousel, you say Nancy Mooney took you there? Yep, she sure did. And she took you into the room where you met these two men. That's right. But she did not introduce you to them. No, she did not. Did she know them, or did she act if she knew them? Yeah, she knew them. And this other girl that lived with Nancy, well, <laughs> Nancy's dead now, but I knew the other girl that lived with Nancy. And if I had a chance to talk to her, of course, I don't know uh, if she would say anything or not. What was her name? I don't know, but uh, then the boy that was with us, I knew his name was Audie Anderson. Audie Anderson? Yes, Audie Anderson. And he was with you when Nancy took you to the club? Yes, he was. And he was present when... No, no, no. He didn't He didn't go inside, none. I believe he stayed out in the car with this other girl when we went inside. But Nancy was in the room with you and these two men. Yes. Nancy was my witness when Warren got shot. She was with me the night he got shot. We were having sexual relations, if you will. Yes, and uh, what did you discuss with these two men after they told you until Ruby was there you couldn't really talk business? Nothing. That's it. In other words, you just walk in. They said, Ruby's not here. I went into a private office for this. Oh, you say you were not in a private office. There was an office there, I say but they didn't say they expected Ruby or anything. They said he would be back in a little while, you know, and then Nancy was sick, so we left him there, and I never did go back that night. I see. In other words, you were in the office. How long would you say all told? Eh, just a short while, just a matter of minutes. I know it wasn't too long. And you don't recall any other conversation, any other comments that were made to you while you were in the room with the two men? No, I can't. I was just off the cuff. The man with the, uh, I don't recall if you described him with white hair or gray hair. He was gray. Was his hair straight, curly, kinky? What do you recall? Well, it was kind of a crop, crop haircut, fairly long crop haircut, fairly long. And would you say he had straight hair, curly hair, kinky hair? For instance, I would describe your hair as a little bit curly. Well, he had a little kind of wavy kind of like, but it wasn't a crop haircut, you know, like a flat top kind of long. Okay, any other names that enter into this thing? Let me ask you this. When did you go back to Dallas? You say you were in Vegas at the time of the assassination, right? Yes. When did you return to Texas? Get into the mic here, Dago, uh, so we'll be able to hear you. Uh, I would say a month or so after that, I went back to Dallas. What was your reason for returning to Dallas? Nancy Mooney, or did you go for another reason? No, no, I just went down there messing around. I went down there, well, I was going with this girl, and I drove her car down there and sold it, and that's uh, that's when Warren got shot then. I see. And they put me in jail this time for shooting him. When you went back to Dallas, did you have warrants out for you in Dallas then? No. In other words, the warrants that they're holding for you now are the ones you incurred after you went back there. Yes. <laughs> did Ruby say anything to you about being able to fix any wraps that you might have? Uh, no, but Garrison did. He told me down here that if I got anything on me in Louisiana, that it, I could just, I could just have a clean slate here. Everything would just disappear, if you know what I'm saying. 
Hmm. Are there any warrants outstanding against you here? I don't know. One reason that you gave me for wanting to make this tape is that you're afraid somebody might uh, think you called it wipe you out. That's right. Why do you fear for your life, Dago? Well, if you see I'm in the Warren Commission, my name's in the Warren Commission. Did you testify before them? No, 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 I didn't, but my name's in there. Did FBI agents or CIA talk to you? Well, I heard they were looking for me, but they never did talk to me, but my name's in there in several places. Mm -hmm. And you take there's been, I don't know, 30-something or other shot uh, that's been in the Warren Commission altogether, so I just figure it's just a matter of time before they snap down on me, too, you feel me? How many people who have died were you connected with directly or indirectly with uh, that you knew personally with the assassination? Well, of course, you know Nancy. Mm -hmm. And you figure that Nancy's hanging herself in her cell is not a true story? Well, no. Because I know her too well for that. And then I know just a short old kind of acquaintance with Ruby. I know him. Like I said, just a short while. Then the guy who killed in Florida about seven or eight months ago, he was a gangster. I knew him. I've been in jail with him before. And what's his connection with this? I don't know. <laughs> uh, just that he was in Dallas at the time. But I know that he wound up dead over it. I know that much. I know that he'd go down there, and they got him, and I know they'd get me. I know that. Now, is there any idea in your mind you're referring to when the, the, you say they? No, just a bunch of other people involved in this here. I don't know exactly who, but whoever it has got a lot of money, you can bet that. In other words, there's no doubt in your mind about the death of President Kennedy was the result of a conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, that all planned. It wasn't no just Harvey Oswald shooting and Jack Ruby running down there and shooting him. There was nothing to that. But did anybody ever directly say to you, Dago, we want you to kill the president? No, but they... Get in front of the mic, please, Dago. Uh, sorry. Uh, they said that Kennedy had to be killed. And this here, and this was here at the car lot, they said that. That was at the car lot. But Ruby never said this to you. No. Nor either of the two men you met at the carousel in Ruby's absence? Well, I didn't talk to them. I mean, I was supposed to go back and talk to them, but I never did. I see. Okay, well, I think that should wrap it up, Dago. Thank you. My pleasure. So that is the Ken Elliott interview with Dago. Daryl Garner. And that sounded to me like a whole lot of fluff and not a whole lot of substance. Too much pastry, not enough cream, if you feel what I'm saying now, uh, from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. No, I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, why Dago would want to have this interview with this Ken Elliott guy and have it recorded and Put out only after he's dead. Based on what he told Elliot, makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, he really didn't say anything, either incriminating himself or anybody else for that matter. A lot of very vague, a lot of very vagueness, you know? Uh, quite different than the Mark Lane interview, I will say. Uh, in that interview, he was much better acquainted with Jack Ruby and his strippers and Lee Harvey Oswald. And now he doesn't say he ever knew Lee Harvey and barely knew Jack. So, <laughs> uh, let's see what he told Garrison. Keep in mind, folks, that Garrison never used Dago Garner. In the trial against Clay Shaw, and I think you'll figure out why in this next interview. <laughs> oh boy.
Here we go. Right. Interrogation of Dago Garner by Jim Garrison, the office of the district attorney, July 18th, 1967. Did you know Warren Reynolds? I know Warren and Johnny, his brother, known to Carlot, known him for quite a while. Did you know Tippett? He came up here all the time and eat around. He knew me. He knew that I would do the first one thing and then another. Warren Reynolds and John had told him I had some rifles for sale. He said he knew where he could t- he could sell some high-powered rifles. I asked him what he was going to do with some rifles, and he said deer hunting. Tippett said that? Yeah. When was this? Shortly before the assassination, he said he didn't uh, know if they were stolen or not. He said nobody would say anything. Tippett said this? Yeah. He said, you ain't got to worry about me, boy. I drank beer in his car, shooting the breeze. You'd seen him before? He'd been down at the carousel club, but I didn't talk to him. He had on a suit and all in. You said he was wearing a suit of clothes? How many times did you see him at the carousel club? Uh, Once or twice. You already knew him and had talked to him? Yes. What did he do at the carousel club? I don't know. (laughs) And then there's a part of it I can't read. It's kind of faded out. Uh... Talking about some guy named Roberts. What did he do for a living? Selling cars for the rental brothers. What happened to Roberts? Somebody shot him with a shotgun. They said he wasn't going with somebody's wife. That's why I got shot. I don't know if he's messing around. Seemed like a pretty straight guy to me. You know where he was shot? No. How long before the assassination? Oh, three, maybe four months, maybe less than that. Did you ever talk to Reynolds about Clay Shaw, as Robert suggested? I talked about it one time, but he didn't say nothing. One morning I was talking to Reynolds, and the subject came up. Uh, Some guy I never saw before was there. Warren or one of them said, Kennedy has to be killed. Warren or the other guy said that? Somebody with Reynolds said that. Did Reynolds say anything? He said something about it, and they said he was going to get in trouble. Before the president was killed? Yes. Did Warren indicate that he knew Clay Shaw? I don't remember. Did you ask him about it? I told him Robert said I could talk to you about where I could make some big money. I didn't go up to him and say anything about Clay Shaw. What did he say? I don't remember. Uh, He just talked about something else. I went out to his house and he said something else, but I told him I could get I told him I could get out of the penny ante stuff. Did Warren Reynolds know Jack Ruby? I don't know. But did he know Tippett? Yes. You say you saw Gordon Devell? You identified this picture of Gordon Devell. Where did you know him from? I've been in jail with him in Dallas. Picture of Clay Shaw. Have you ever seen this man? I have seen a guy in the carousel club. Uh, I went with Nancy Mooney to meet some guys, make some big money. Guy looked something like this. Guy was dressed a lot better and looked a lot younger, but as far as build, looks uh, about the same. I got a drink. Nancy went back in the private office, and uh, he told them who it was, but they couldn't talk about it until Jack got back Just for the record, this picture we talked about of Clay Shaw is not a very good picture of Shaw. It was taken after he was arrested, and he doesn't even have a tie on. Uh, You say the man you met had on a tie? Oh, yes. Real nice-looking clean cut guy. Was he tall? Tall? Taller than you? Yes. What color hair? Gray. And they talk about the fellow that was with him, the Italian fellow. Uh, picture was our Sergio Acasha, except Sergio Acasha was about 5'8". Uh, he was something similar to that. 
showing a picture of Emilio Santana. Oh, yeah. That that guy was with Jack Ruby a lot. This fellow was very short. Yeah, little bitty guy. Did you ever see him with anybody else but Ruby? Uh, one night when this boy came out of the house, spent the night out there, Nancy was there then. We're talking about the short guy that was going with Ruby. This is the guy that was going with him. If you know what I'm saying. He had a relationship of some kind with Ruby. Do you know where he was staying? No. Do you know what they called him? No. Did he speak English? Never talked to him. The interesting thing about your identification of Emilio Santana as the guy who was associated with Ruby, this is almost the exact description of the man who shot Warren Reynolds. Very short and strong looking. How many times do you think you saw this fella showing a picture of Emilio Santana? Uh, I seen him about three or four times at the nightclub there, Ruby's. Uh, that's why I couldn't believe the things that Nancy was telling me, that they were geared up together there, you know. He had uh, relations with Nancy before, too, you know. Ruby, you mean? Yeah. I don't mean uh, they had this private party there. And he was out there stripping for him. And this was before the assassination. You know, the boy that was in the penitentiary, he was playing out there. She was out there stripping that night at the private party there in Dallas. Carousel or Vega? No, no. The private party. Do you know who it was else was at the private party? There's one guy I know uh, does because he was playing there. Do you know his name? Not offhand, but I can find out. He is not in the penitentiary now? No. You were talking about this man that the FBI talked to, too? Yes. Refers to the picture of Clay Shaw. Does that one look familiar? The guy looks something like him. A little more distinguished here because he has his tie on. Uh, this could have been him in Dallas. After Nancy Mooney brought you into the two fellows, uh, the gray-haired fellow and the Italian-looking fella, they wouldn't talk to you in jo until Jack Ruby came? Yes. They said they had to wait for Jack. So we're back to this story about that. The medium on industrial. Now here's a p picture of a friend of Santana's. This man's name is Miguel Torres. Oh, yeah. He came to the Beckley Club many times. What's the Beckley? What's the Beckley Club? Ah, it's a place on Jefferson near near the Texas Theater. How was he usually dressed? Looked like a Mexican with short. Uh, this fellow is Cuban. Did he speak English? Ah, Cuban, Latino. They all look Mexican to me. I spoke with him. Ever seen him with anybody? It's been a long time. He is a dope addict. I've messed around with a little dope too, sir. Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Do you know him in that connection? Nope. Can't say that I have, but he seems like a nice fella. He is from New Orleans, but you feel like you have seen him in Dallas? I've seen him at the Beckley. That's an eating place? Yes. Do you know if Oswald ever went there? No. Nope. Have you ever seen this fellow? His name is Morris Brownlee. Uh, I've never seen him. Never seen Brownlee. Look, this friend of mine, we all stayed together all the time during this time here. He messed around with a little pot, if you know what I'm saying. If there was anybody fixing up or anything like that, he would know him. In Dallas? Yeah. Would your friend talk to anybody here? If you got him tied up tight enough, he might. <laughs> what do you mean? Get him scared enough. Ever hear of Guy Gabaldon? Never heard the name. Earlene Roberts? That was Oswald's landlady. Did you know her? Not personally. <laughs> or, sorry, not personally. How do you know that that was Oswald's landlady. I read it in the paper. What about Bertha Cheek? She's a past acquaintance of Jack Ruby and the sister of Erlene Roberts. 
Nope. I don't know her. Lewis Logue. Nope. Never heard of him. Manny Rodriguez. Gilbert Sanchez. I know a bunch of Sanchez's. Manuel Gonzalez? Yeah, I know of Emmanuel Gonzalez. I know one in Dallas. I know one in California. Who? The one in Dallas, what's he look like? Short, stocky guy, long hair, heavy built. Does he have a nickname? I think we called him Buddha. Have you ever heard of anybody by the nickname of Toro or El Toro? I know one we called the Bull, but not Toro. Who was that? That was a Jesus Garcia. Or, sorry, hey, Jesus Garcia. What was his full name? Do you know? Juan Jesus Garcia. Gomez Cortez or El Tech? I never heard that name. You know a man named Manuel Garcia Gonzalez? I have heard of the name several times. What about Manny Gonzalez? Heavy set with black hair. What's he do for a living? Ah, he lived over on the west side, ran around with Sonny Kane and Danny Smith, known as known as old Lop Ear. <laughs> Had this one ear that folded over <laughs> like a bloody rabbit. How about Audie Anderson? Did he know Manuel Gonzalez? I imagine he did. Do you know of anybody in the electronics business in Dallas? Nope. Ever see a Latin fellow about six foot tall, heavy set, about 240, wears glasses in electronics business? Nope. Do you know Breck Wall? Nope. He is the guy they had shot at the Adolphus. Do you know Bruce Ray Carlin? I know one. I called him Brucey Ray. Big tall guy, whole lot of etchings on his face. Was he related? Bruce Ray, the Bruce Ray I'm talking about is the husband of little Lynn Carr that worked for Jack Ruby. Cigarette girl? Is that the fellow? No. Did you ever talk to Warren Reynolds at all after the assassination? No, they kind of got a little down on me. Told me not to come on their, on their lot no more. Uh, we got in a little hassle out there. I came from California, had a car, and I wanted to sell it to him. When was this? After the assassination. What this was when he got shot? He either got shot that night or the next night when I tried to sell him the car. I don't think I talked to him, actually. I think I talked to his brother, John. You never talked to Reynolds anymore? No, I called out there and talked to John one day before they put me back in jail for the second time. They said the best thing to do is just forget it and don't come around there no more. And Reynolds told him that you shot him. No, no. Well, somebody must have. I got on the phone. Reynolds talked. Then they started following me all the time afterwards. Neville showed up in Vegas shortly after the assassination. Did you ever see him in Vegas? I did hear some remarks talking about he'd been in Vegas in the newspapers and stuff. Did you ever hear of Honest Joe or the name of Ruby Goldberg. That's him partner down there. If you have a, have a hassle or some kind of fight, a go-between, you know what I mean? If you need to buy something or sell something. He does things for Jack Ruby. They were real close to one another. You can find Jack Ruby's picture in there. You can buy any kind of gun you want. He specializes in rifles. Yep, rifles, high power ones. Is Ruby Goldstein on pretty good terms with the Dallas Police Force? They don't mess with him. I guess he's got something going for him. On top of Honest Joe's station wagon, there's a machine gun. What is that for? To catch attention? Yeah, I guess so. People down there were talking to me and wanted to know who was the guy around the grassy knoll in the car that was traveling around there had a radio aerial on top or something. Where was Tippett when the assassination occurred? Straight over the bridge. How do you know Officer Tippett was there? I have some friends there at the station. They they had asked me about it. And this was in January? You got a gun in January 64? I had a gun. 
a 22 Beretta that I got illegally and got busted. And that was when Tippett was trying to buy a gun from me. Did Jack Ruby indicate why he was giving you a gun? Uh, Ruby didn't give it to me. Some of the guys tied up with Ruby that Nancy knew. They're all fans, see? You got the gun after the assassination. Yes, sir. After the assassination, I've talked to, uh, she talked to me about it before. One night before Kennedy was assassinated, I went to a meeting and she told me then. Was the show on then? They had an intermission at the show when I got there. Do you remember about what time it was and you saw the gray haired man at Jack Ruby's? Oh, about 10 or 11. In his office? Ruby's private office. Was Larry Crayford working for Jack Ruby then? I don't know. Do you know any other guys that work for these fellows? No, no. A girlfriend of Nancy's, her buddy had something to do with it. They didn't tell you anything. You had to be real pat before they told you anything. They had to really know something about you before they would talk to you. Was it your impression that Jack Ruby was tied in with some racketeers? I believe he had something going on. He wouldn't offer me a job if he didn't. Did Nancy give you any idea of the type of work involved? Nope. The man that was with the gray-haired man, the Italian, did he have a scar? I don't know. He didn't have a mustache. What about Lawrence Howard? What time of day did you see him at the carousel? Oh, one afternoon, he was a bouncer there. We had an argument. This is a picture of Lawrence Howard. Is this the bouncer you had the argument with? Do you remember what it was about? Did he have an accent? Actually, I think all he did. Sorry. <laughs> did he have an accent? Actually, all I think, think all he did, me and that bouncer got into it. What a time. They don't like you hanging around there. The bouncer said something. And... Was Jack Ruby there at the time? I believe he was that day. Jack Ruby came through there. And when he did, he stopped and talked to a few people. He was real stiff-necked. Jack Ruby was a stiff-necked? Yeah, kind of insulting. Big chop. Big man. I thought he was supposed to be the kind of guy that gave you a big hello. But maybe that was only with people he thought were important. He talked to me. He told me to come down and see him. He did not give you a gun himself. Did he tell you about big money? No, Nancy talked to him. She told me. Just before Warren got shot, me and Nancy and another couple were sitting in the car outside the house there. Talking about first one thing and then another. And I was drunk and wasn't paying attention. And Nancy and the other people were talking. The other girl worked at the carousel club and she was a cigarette girl. And there was another boy. Uh, describe the girl. Oh, she had long black hair. They were talking about Ruby and the people who were coming down there. Indicating something was going on? Ah, no, this was after the assassination. They were talking about people showing up before the assassination? Yes. Did they mention any of the people at the meetings? Don't know. Did Nancy ever mention to you about other uh, Latinos or Mexicans around the house, around her apartment? I don't know whose name the apartment was rented in. Do you recall any Latins, Cubans, or Mexicans? Oh, yeah. There was always a bunch of them people uh, coming in and out like Grand Central fucking Station. What about Emilio Santana? Did you ever see him or talk to him? I saw him with Jack Ruby. They pointed him out. Nancy said that Jack Ruby and Emilio Santana were living together, if you know what I mean. How long before the assassination was that? I don't know, short time before, a few weeks or so, there was a, another guy who slept at the pad as well. Nancy's pad? Yes, sir. He looked like him. He looked something like him? Yeah. Did you ever see Santana at the carousel club? Yes. Do you know anyone else who may be able to identify anyone at the club? I know two people. Uh, one, I'd have trouble getting up here. Uh, there were three or four friends who stayed around with me and Nancy all the time who saw Santana. Can you name them? Yeah. Audie Anderson, 
I don't know the, the whole name. There was Petticoat. What's that name? Petticoat. Like a woman's slip. Why did you call him that? Just a nickname. His name's Petty Card. He sells stuff all the time. What kind of stuff? Nope. Yeah. At East Grand. That's where old Lop Ear would be, too. Did Lop Ear see Santana with Ruby? More than likely. Anyone else? Anyone else? Ah, two or three girls that hung around there. I was living with one of them for four or five months before I come down here. Since Nancy was killed? Ah, she worked at the drive-in and danced at a private club on David Street. She used to work for Jack Ruby? She would be at some of the private parties with Ruby. What's her name now? I don't know her name. I lived with her for five months and don't even remember her name. Do you ever remember Santana being called by his first name? Nope. He was just sitting there drinking and Jack Ruby come by and rub on his leg and say, this is my boy. Was he the Mexican Cuban type? Yes, sir. Did he ever talk at all? Mm -mm. Not to me. Nancy said he's the boy who's living with Jack Ruby. What was Nancy doing at the time? I, I was hustling her horn her out then. Pimping her out before the assassination, you know. When did she start working for Ruby? Uh, she worked for him some, just right before the assassination, three weeks or so before she went out and stripped for him at a party. Is it your impression that Santana was with Ruby around that time? For that, I'd say. I asked you earlier about Larry Schmidt. Have you ever seen him? I believe so. What did he look like? Oh, he was German. Not quite as big as I am. Long nose, wavy black hair. Did he have a German accent? Not that I know of. But he was from Germany. Yeah. And some more smudgy smudge. Did you ever meet any of the people who knew Nancy when she worked for the library? Uh, maybe the Donnings. What'd they do? Hey, groovy young boys. The police hit us up in front of Nancy's house one night for investigation. Did you ever know Ruth Payne? No. No, but I knew lots of pains. Pains in the ass. Did you ever know any of the people that knew Oswald's wife, Marina? Nope. Did Nancy ever say anything to you about the assassination? That night we talked about it. She was real worried about it. She never did come out and say it. But she had a cool hand, Luke. What did she say that indicated she was worried? Well, the police talked to her. And they came when Reynolds got shot. And said and she told me something about that. Talking about the hassles. Going back to the assassination in November, almost two months before Reynolds was shot, did she talk about the assassination at all? I left about that time. I stayed for a while in Vegas and then came back uh, just before Reynolds was shot. Did she ever say anything about Ruby's connections? She said he was a queer. He met her like a homosexual. He could get me in with him and I could make good money. Did you ever ask her what he, she was talking about? No, never did. Here are some pictures of Mario Bermudez. Can you identify him, the man with the mustache? Never seen him before. I take it Nancy was closed-mouthed after the assassination? Look, she was worried. The other girl is, too. Real shook up about it. Uh, smudge, smudged. He was shot at uh, in Gardenia, California. Who shot at you nine months ago? I was at a bar over there and had a, a guy come up and talk to me. It was open house, you know, everybody drinking, paying no attention to what room you were in. The guy came in and had a gun on him. He had talked to me and finally got around to saying something about Reynolds. He said he knew me. Then I left there and went to catch a bus. Anyway, I went down to get the bus and he shot at me. 
He must have used a silencer because I heard the bullets before I saw him. I never heard the bullets before I saw him. He was on foot? Yes, I stayed in the garage at a friend's hotel after a while. Did you run? Hell yeah. Pretty fast? As fast as I could. Uh, if he missed me the first time, I wasn't going to give him another chance. What did he look like? I don't know. I was running. Was he fat or thin? Just a man, Mr. Garrison. That's all I know. Was he Latino or American? American, I guess. I just wanted to get away. I'm running away, sir. I am not looking behind me. Why did he shoot at you? He don't just go up and talk to people like that without a reason. You think I asked this fellow why he's shooting at me? I so I told you, I am running away, sir. Did he come from Dallas? I don't know where in the hell he came from. Another time in Long Beach, I got shot at. How long ago was this? About June or July of last year. Somebody wanted me to go into the police station and give myself up. I told them, stop shooting at me, and they didn't believe me. Was this before or after the first shooting? After. The Gardenia shooting was nine months uh, after that. Another man. was killed in Long Beach, a detective or something. It was a news reporter. He said he was cleaning his gun and accidentally put a hole in his head. Do you know Tom Beckham? I heard his name, but I don't know where from. I know Tom Howard. He got killed. He used to get me out of jail and didn't charge me nothing but a blowjob. And, and Nay Wade, he's Henry Wade's brother. He's a queer, too. He knew Jack Ruby as well. Who, who got you out of jail? Tom Howard, Tyler Sullivan, and Hay Wade, Nay Wade. I know Tom Howard, the friend of Jack Ruby's. Would you tell me again what Hugh Ainsworth suggested to you? Something about going back to Dallas. I talked to Lieutenant Cunningham in Dallas. He told me to get out of New Orleans or I'd be hanged by the balls if I stayed there. Did he say why he would do this to you? Nope. Did he say anything about Newsweek? He said you did not have anything. Did he say anything about Newsweek in connection with Clay Shaw? He said they were representing Clay Shaw. Newsweek was representing Clay Shaw? That's what he said, sir. So there you have. <laughs> there goes Jim Garrison interview. I could only imagine the thoughts going through Jim Garrison's mind after talking to that son bitch. Holy wow. No wonder he never used him against Clay Shaw. But man. Man or oh man. Now what's interesting about all this is that Warren Reynolds also <laughs> Uh, was friendly with General Walker, General Edwin Walker there in Dallas as well. Um, he used to talk to the general all the time, was an extreme right winger like the general. And I believe uh was in instrumental in getting uh, Reynolds to speak to the Warren Commission was General Walker. Uh, so very interesting there. We know he used to visit the general's house. Um, probably, probably homosexual tendencies like all the rest of these fellas. Uh, I believe Dago would go both ways. Um, as did Jack Ruby. <laughs> Although apparently he would just, he would just eat him and stuff. According to Dago. <laughs> uh, so let's end this with a bang, shall we? Uh, 
and as I said, you know, poor Dago would go only to live another five years or so. Uh, ended up ODing, passing away. So next up, I have the Mark Lane interview of Warren Reynolds. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, where are you employed? At the Johnny Reynolds Car Company. And were you working there on November 22nd, 1963? Yes, sir. How close is the used car lot which you worked to the scene of the tippet killing? One block. Were you there at about one o'clock on the 22nd? Yes, sir. And then what happened? What did you see? What did you hear? We were listening. If Mr. Blake would just start, okay. what did you see and what did you hear? Well, we were listening to the radio about the assassination or about the attempted assassination of Kennedy. And we heard these shots going off. And we run out on this porch and we saw this gunman who we know later is Oswald running up the street. And I followed him for a block until I lost him. And then I was going back to the used car lot and this policeman stopped me and asked me what happened. And I told him that I had seen this man with a gun and I'd followed him, but I lost him. So he took the description and my name and stuff like that. And while I was talking to him, some television camera was taking the pictures. And after that, I went on back to the used car lot. Were you questioned by agents of the FBI or the U.S. Secret Service? No, I sure wasn't. Were you questioned by FBI agents of the Secret Service during December 1963? No, sir, I sure wasn't. Were you questioned by FBI agents or Secret Service during January of 64? Yes, sir, I was. And when was that, sir? That was on January the 21st. Two agents came out and they talked to me and asked me what I had seen and I told them. And they showed me three pictures. And I identified the pictures of the man I knew then as Lee Harvey Oswald. And I identified them and they left. And Mr. Reynolds, on page 171 of the Warren Commission report, the commission states Reynolds did not make positive identification when interviewed uh, by the FBI. What is your comment on that? That's definitely an error. You were questioned by agents of the FBI on January 21st, 64. Then what happened? Well, two days after that, I was closing up the used car lot one night, and I went downstairs to turn off the lights. And some gunman was hidden down there, and he shot me. He shot me through the glasses right here, and the bullet lodged right over here. I, I staggered upstairs and got this towel to stop the blood, and the gunman ran by me, and I just caught a blur of him. Then I went on in the office, and I called the police. And then I laid on a car uh, on a divan until they got there. Mr. Reynolds, who knew about your questioning by the FBI between the time you were actually questioned by them and the time that you were shot by it two days later? Just my friends and, well, of course, my family. Do you think the attack upon you in January was related to uh, what you had seen on November 22nd? I believe the only way we can find out is to find out who shot me and to prove what he did and that we can figure from there. Do you know whether or not the commission conducted an investigation to determine whether or not there was a relationship between these two events? I heard that they asked Captain Fritz his opinion. Well, I'd like to read to you, Mr. Reynolds, Captain Fritz's testimony, his entire testimony in this area. He was questioned by an attorney for the Warren Commission who asked him, and I'm now reading from volume four, page 235. Did you hear of Warren Reynolds? Warren Reynolds? He was shot sometimes afterwards. Used car lot man? Yeah, used car lot man. Yeah, I talked to him. He was shot through the head. Yes. I didn't talk to him very long because I didn't have to talk to him long. I didn't have to talk to him very long, but he told me two or three different stories, and I could tell he was a sick man, and he had no doubt brain damage from that bullet, and he is apt to say anything. What did he say? He told me that he told me two or three stories. One story he told me when they brought him in to me for me to talk to him, he told me that he saw this Ruby coming down there, and he told him, he said he followed him and saw which way he went. Ruby? Saw Oswald? Oswald? 
Yes, Oswald. And I questioned him further, and I asked him how far, how close was the closest you were ever to him? How far were you from him? And he said, well, from that car lot across the street there. Well, of course, if he had been at a car lot across the street, it would be difficult to follow him on the sidewalk. It would be quite difficult, so I talked to him for just a short time, and I didn't bother with him anymore. I already had some history on him because the other bureau, the forgery bureau, had been briefing and handling him, and they had already told me a lot about him. They discounted anything that he said. Did you find out who shot him and why he was shot? The man on the car lot? Yeah. Well, they think it might have been over a car deal gone bad, but they're not positive, and I don't know that he will ever tell them the truth. Have you ever discovered any connection between the shooting of Warren Reynolds and the killing of the president? Never. The assassination of the president? None at all. The killing of Tippett? No. We found nothing. We checked everything. Any connection between Oswald and Warren Reynolds or Ruby and Warren, Warren Reynolds? We found no connection. We had all kinds of rumors, of course, that they were connected, but we didn't find anything. Did you investigate it? Yes, sir. I had some officers investigated, and the forgery bureau investigated him because they were already working on the shooting case. They handled all the shootings where people were not killed. See, then it wouldn't be a homicide. I see. What is your comment, Mr. Reynolds, upon Captain Fritz's judgment on you? I believe Captain Fritz is a probably a very fine police officer. I don't believe he's a real good doctor. My physician is Dr. Tom Nash, said there is definitely no brain damage, and I'm just as normal as I've always been. The commission concluded on page 663 of its report that it was wild speculation for anyone to think that there might be a connection between the fact that you were shot in January and the fact that you observed the gunman flee from the scene of the Tippett shooting and positively identified him as Oswald. But after the shooting, you weren't very sure. Well, sir, one can see why. So, fascinating stuff, folks. Fascinating stuff about Dago and Warren Reynolds and the like. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff going on with old uh, Dago and a lot of these Dallas characters and the Garrison investigation in New Orleans is always a colorful place to be. That's right. So for Dago, for Dago, <laughs> Daryl Gardner, and Johnny Warren Reynolds, and Captain Will Fritz. And Ken Elliott and Jim Garrison. This is Big Bad Bob. Hey, check me out on socials at the Lone Gummin 7. Head to the YouTube page. Just search for the Lone Gummin Podcast on YouTube. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Make sure you ring the bell to get notified. And make sure you are liking and sharing videos. Comment all you want. I don't give a shit. Blow it all up, baby. Let's do it. That's it for now. This has been your boy. Episode 259 is in the can. Beamed up that satellite down directly to your ears, people. This is your boy, the Triple B. Peace.
backseat of his car. Blood was on his head. Mrs. Kennedy cried, oh no. And